Hello everyone, my name is Anitsu, and I'm back with another Digimon video. So, uh, BT05 uh, Battle of Omni is on the horizon, and uh, with that, uh, we get a slew of new cards and a lot of changes to the overall meta, and it is important to understand uh, what the meta is currently going to be doing and what it's going to be looking like, so that way you're best prepared to tackle whatever you feel like you're going to be playing with and against. So uh, going over my tier list, uh, just as a quick little aside, just because something is in a particular tier doesn't mean that I'm valuing the slots uh, where they are as heavily as others might. So just because a card is furthermost to the left or right doesn't necessarily mean I value that deck more or least. I think all of these decks in any given tier are as equally powerful as each other. And just because you don't see a particular Digimon on this tier list, it doesn't mean that card isn't good or that card isn't going to be played. Most of the time, the card is probably going to be buried within a variant of any of these deck lists, or the deck is just outside of what the Japanese meta has been performing like, because a lot of this data is interpreted from the Japanese side of the meta. And based on the differences between English and Japanese playstyles and the differences in our formats, I kind of uh, tried my best to, to adjust and accommodate for those changes when making this tier list. And just keep in mind that because this is a tier list, this is just my thoughts and my general opinion on how I feel like the BT05 uh, format and meta is going to be shaping up based on all of the information that I've been looking at. So without further ado, going into the tier list, starting with the first slot, we have Crusadermon, or Lord Nightmon. So Lord Nightmon is looking to be a very powerful deck, and what the Lord Nightmon deck is essentially doing is basically the same thing that the War Greymon deck was doing, but better. So even though you don't get multi attacks the fact that Lord Nightmon just buffs herself is really huge, and the fact that she'll just automatically play level 3s for free is already really big. But on top of that, she also could play Digimon with a Warrior in their attributes, so their attribute just has to be Warrior in order for them to be played, but you get some really powerful warriors that you could be playing in the form of Nightmon. So Nightmon is just a very powerful Digimon because you basically can play a level 5 for free, and that level 5 also has an on-play ability of minusing 4,000 DP, all adding to the power of what Lord Nightmon is doing, because then you could go into a second Mega really quickly and really efficiently because of that ability, setting Lord Nightmon apart from most other decks, on top of which Yellow gets even better control tools and better level 3s to just further round out what makes Yellow so good. So all of that combined is just what's making Lord Nightmon just a very powerful deck to be playing. Now, the second deck on this list is a very tentative slot because it is a slot that really just depends on the type of deck and builds that you're going to be playing. Just because Security Control does have a couple of different offshoots on how you could play it. You could either play it more Digimon and Megazoo based or you could play it more options and aggro based. So there's just a couple of different ways that you could build it. But the fact that Security Control is still just going to be a very powerful and prominent deck just because of all of the different removal tools that it's getting. And the more removal tools that's getting added into the deck just make it a very powerful and very obnoxious deck to be dealing with because it plays the game a little bit differently than most other decks where you're just trying to kill everything the opponent has and you're trying to heal keeping your security as healthy as possible and you're going to have your security try to deal most of the damage and most of the work and a lot of your threats are going to be coming out of the security because you also have security Digimon like Omnimon Sword D added into the mix to just add to the overall power and potential that security control has making it just still a very powerful deck to be running. Then another deck that we got in the tier 1 slot is going to be uh, Omni Shoutmon. So uh, Omni Shoutmon is looking to be a pretty powerful deck because it is just doing lots of really powerful things because of how you could build Omni Shoutmon. So Omni Shoutmon is a, a really unique card where you could digivolve it on top of your level 6s and then you'll gain some additional benefits based on how you build your Omni Shoutmon. The most common way is to just make Omni Shotman as powerful as you possibly can with a whole bunch of different and powerful inheritable abilities, and he even has his own abilities that, that allow him to attack even when you pass the memory onto the opponent because of the advanced mechanic or the blitz mechanic. 
So that's just what's making Omni Shoutmon really, really powerful. On top of which, it also just has a whole bunch of very powerful control type tools that it could utilize, and you could build it in a variety of different ways, just making it a very powerful red deck to be playing. Next up, uh, we have uh, Chaos Gallantmon. So Chaos Gallantmon also has a couple of different builds that you could be utilizing, and one of the more common ways is just playing a generic, like, go to Chaos Gallantmon and then have Chaos Gallantmon do most of the work, and then when you feel ready, just go into either of the Omnimons or Millenniumon to just try to wrap things up and control even further. So what makes the deck so powerful is the fact that Chaos Gallantmon just has a really nice built-in removal ability. On top of, he has a really nice built-in recursion ability, and uh, you could utilize uh, all of the uh, tools uh, and self-sacrificing synergies to their utmost potential thanks to this card. And you also have new level 7s in purple and black to be working around with, all adding up to making it a very strong and very powerful tempo-efficient deck. Just because uh, Purple had a lot of really good control tools before, and now they have even more added to that pool, and on top of which they just get a whole bunch of more generically decent tools to be playing around with to uh, make your cards as powerful and efficient as they possibly could be. And then the last deck in the tier 1 slot is going to be Nidhogmon slash Rufflesimon. So I'm just going to label it as Green Digiburst, just because Rufflesimon is going to be one of the big primary factors on what makes this deck so good, just because Rufflesimon is very powerful for what Green Digiburst is doing, because she has the ability of whenever you use a Digiburst ability to just lock one of the opponent's Digimons out of attacking or blocking. So you could use this to shut out uh, attackers, or you could use this to shut out blockers to allow yourself to aggress, and on top of which you're still going to be running Nidhoggmon, which is an absolutely fantastic control tool to just basically board wipe the opponent for having their Digimon suspended, and he'll even help suspend Digimon, and you have other tools that could also help suspend Digimon, on top of which you get even more Digiburst synergy cards to be playing around with, creating a couple of different and varied builds that are all very powerful and doing uh, very strong things, thus setting it apart from a lot of the other decks. Next, going over tier 2, we have Hexablaumon. So Hexablaumon is looking to be a pretty powerful deck, and uh, what makes him so powerful is the fact that he has a really nice ability to just lock the opponent's uh, Digimon down from basically doing anything, just because uh, he also has the ability to remove their inheritable sources, and when the opponent's Digimon doesn't have any inheritable sources in them, then they can't attack or block. Granted, they could still use some various other abilities, and if they have any passives, then those passives will also work, but the fact that he could just uh, turn off a lot of the opponent's offense and defense is really good, on top of which he has some really easy ways of attacking the opponent's inheritable sources to turn this ability online to shut down what the opponent is trying to do, and on top of all of that, he even will gain the jamming ability when the opponent has Digimon without any Digivolution sources in play when he's attacking, so he's going to be attacking into the opponent's security rather safely. So uh, that's just a lot to take in, all for what this card is going to be doing and what he's going to be adding into the deck. And there's a couple of different ways that you could build them to help either the offense or defense. So the fact that we have new Omnimons that could help add a little bit more control tools uh, because blue isn't necessarily the best at interacting with the opponent's Digimon is really good. We also have a new Omnimon that allows you to aggress even easier than before. So that makes... Uh, blue a little bit better than it did before because you have now a little bit more aggro potential so you could play a whole bunch of different cards and a whole bunch of different variants to make this a really powerful deck to be playing thus landing it in the tier 2 slot. The only problem with the deck is the fact that it is so heavily reliant on Hexablaumon living and staying on the field that when Hexablaumon isn't on the field then the deck starts to fumble and falter and uh, that is the big core problem that's keeping the deck apart from being tier 1 is the fact that uh, there is a very high chance that uh, Hexablaumon is only going to be on the field for maybe a turn, two turns at most just because of how much control and removal tools there are in the game that every color has access to. 
Now, the next deck in the Tier 2 slot uh, is going to be Yellow War Greymon. So, Yellow War Greymon is still just a very powerful deck. It really doesn't get a whole lot of new or interesting tools. You could build it a little bit more aggro, you could build it a little bit more control, but for the most part, it's the same deck that we've been playing in BTO4, with just some minute upgrades depending on the type of build that you want to play it in. It's just the fact that dealing damage to yourself and not having as good of a recovery plan versus just being able to do the same thing and not deal damage to yourself really makes the deck a little bit weaker in comparison to something like uh, Lord Nightmon on top of the fact that uh, Lord Nightmon will have just an easier time living it turn to turn just because Lord Nightmon buffs herself where War Greymon doesn't. So they're basically doing almost the exact same thing. It's just a yellow War Greymon is going to be a little bit weaker than Lord Nightmon. Next uh, we have uh, Red Omnimon. So uh, Red Omnimon is looking to be a really powerful deck with, again, a couple of different ways you could build it depending on how you want to support it. But uh, from what I could tell in uh, BT05, uh, building it uh, with a Greymon package and Greymon engine is definitely the way to go just because Nokia definitely helps fuel that Greymon engine to be a little bit more efficient. And on top of which, we finally have a good draw engine on our Digitama slot that also requires the use of Greymons. So the Gray Greymon Omnimon deck is definitely looking like it's going to be a really good deck just because uh, we have A, new Omnimons, B, really good uh, Omnimons already, and C, we finally get a good engine going that the deck was lacking before, so it just adds up to be a really nice and really powerful deck. Next, uh, we have Rookie Rush. So yes, Rookie Rush is not dead. Rookie Rush is still going to be a deck, and it has two powerful variants that you could play. You could play the uh, green-blue variant, uh, which we're all familiar with at this point. It does get a couple of new tools that you could consider utilizing, but for the most part, a lot of people made the hard shift to the yellow-green variant, just because the yellow-green variant also has some very powerful cards, just because yellow is a very powerful color especially with how many good low-end cards they got and are getting, just adds to the overall power output of what Rookie Rush in yellow could be doing. And then the green side is basically the same no matter which build you're playing, just because the green package doesn't really change and you don't need to change it just because of how good the green package is. But the fact that we still have two very powerful versions of Rookie Rush that are both very consistent is definitely what makes the deck really, really good. On top of which, it is a deck that if not prepared against, then it definitely could easily take the games just because of how fast it generally likes to be playing, and especially with all of the new tools that it's getting to help with the overall aggression, it just uh, solidifies that, that the deck is still going to be a very powerful deck. Now, it does have a couple of bad matchups and a couple of hard counters, but that doesn't mean that the deck is dead or bad, and no, for the last time, Takumi does not kill Rookie Rush. Takumi does almost nothing against Rookie Rush. He is not a hard counter, and you're going to have a very hard time slotting him in a lot of decks that don't necessarily feel like they could utilize him. So he is not a counter to Rookie Rush. Hexablaumon is a better counter to Rookie Rush, and that's why like Hexablaumon is in the Tier 2 slot, just because Hexablaumon can turn off a lot of decks. But the fact that Rookie Rush can still beat a lot of decks just because of how fast and efficient it is, is why it's still a very powerful and very prominent deck that should not be slept on. And then the last deck in the Tier 2 slot is going to be Imperial Jamon Dragon Mode. So this is going to be the blue variant just because the green variant isn't very good at all, at least not right now. And uh, the blue variant just has even more damage output than it did before, thanks to the new Omnimon with the advanced slash blitz mechanic. So uh, that just adds uh, even more power to what uh, Imperial Jamon is doing. And the fact that Imperial Jamon just can multi-attack really quickly all in one turn uh, that could deal three to four, even sometimes five or more damage in a single turn just makes it a very powerful deck, especially because blue also has really good early game aggression. You just chip away at the opponent's security as early as you possibly can, then try to find a way to get into Imperial Jamon to just try to swing out for game when you go into Imperial Jamon. And that's still just a very powerful strategy just because it doesn't have exactly the most counterplay to it, just because if you don't have a blocker or you don't anticipate as many attacks, then he could easily steal the game from you. Next to going into tier three, we have uh, Zubagon Punch. 
So the Zubagon Punch deck can basically be played in a whole bunch of different ways, and uh, there's just a lot of new and powerful black tools that, that we have access to to just to play the deck in a lot of different ways. So you could play it with a more reboot-heavy style with the new Metal Gururumon, just because the new Metal Gururumon's Digiburst ability just allows you to just straight up burn one of the opponent's security, and then uh, you could just uh, go into Zubagon Punch and try to deal even more damage afterward, just because uh, the Digiburst Digiburst ability is a when digivolving ability on Metal Garurumon, so you still get to keep some inheritable sources, so you could still probably try to get a buff going, so that way it can be 13 to utilize Zubagon Punch. Then you still have access to the promo Black War Greymon, you still have Blastmon, you still have just a whole bunch of other really powerful Black Digimon that you could be utilizing with Zubagon Punch to try to deal as much damage as you humanly possibly can, and you have Chaosmon and a couple of other level 7s to just try to help close out the game with to act as some even more control. All adding up to making Zubagon Punch a really powerful deck, but the only unfortunate thing about Black as a whole is it doesn't have that great of a draw engine or a resource uh, value engine. It did get War Monzimon or Wear Monzimon to uh, try to help round the deck out, but it's still just a little bit slower than a lot of the other decks, thus keeping it back. But it's still just a very powerful deck to be playing around with and can still perform relatively well given the right meta and given the right matchups. Next, uh, we have Ancient Garurumon. So Ancient Garurumon, for the most part, is just a uh, really decent deck just because there is some more Garurumon support in the set. Hybrids are still really good, and for the most part, you're basically just playing Blue Rookie Rush that just tries to go into your hybrids to try to close out the game. And then you also have uh, access to Ancient Gurumon to basically act like a uh, Imperial German Dragon Mode to try to get as many attacks out as you possibly can in a single turn to try to close out the game. And the fact that you do have a warp to play uh, Ancient Gurumon even easier definitely makes it a really good deck. But it is just a little bit slower and a little bit less consistent than Imperial German or Rookie Rush. And that's really the only thing that's holding it back. But it's still a really decent deck to be playing around with nonetheless. Next, we also have uh, Purple Metal Garurumon. So for the most part, this deck really doesn't get a whole lot of changes. Uh, Purple does get a couple of uh, new tools that you could possibly be thinking about playing around with. But the fact that the deck, for the most part, remains mostly unchanged uh, means that it's not going to be performing as well because it doesn't get as many new or powerful tools to help it keep up with a lot of the other top decks. On top of which, it still has a small inconsistency issue where if you don't see your options when you have Purple Metal Garurumon, then it's still going to be a rather hard deck to play just because... Uh, that's like what you need in order for the deck to function, but when the deck does function and you're able to play things as fast and efficiently as the other decks, then it's still just going to be a very strong deck to be playing around with. It's just, again, it's not as fast or consistent as a lot of the other decks, and that's really the only thing holding it back from being higher on the tier list. Next, uh, we have Shine Greymon. So this is going to be the yellow Shine Greymon still. The red Shine Greymon just is a more casual deck that uh, is a pretty hard deck to set up. But uh, yellow Shine Greymon is still looking to be a pretty decent uh, deck just because he is the originator of how much removal is going to be in the game. And he's still just a really good gatekeeper deck where if you can't necessarily beat uh, yellow Shine Greymon, can you reasonably beat any of these other decks? And yellow Shine Greymon still just has a very strong comeback potential where you just try to take some damage early just to try to get your tamers out for free hoping they're in your security and then you just slam down a shine Greymon, wiping the opponent's board and that's still just very powerful it's just that the only unfortunate thing is that like a lot of these other decks the updates that he got weren't necessarily the most meaningful. You could run a little bit of Nokia just to make the Greymons a little bit more efficient, but Nokia doesn't have any synergy because she's a white tamer. But regardless, there's still just a lot of power and potential that Yellow Shine still has just because of how good his removal ability and comeback potential is, making him still a very solid deck to consider playing around with. Now, the next deck in the tier 3 slot is going to be Lilithmon. So Lilithmon got her own kind of cute little combo called the Lilith Loop, 
where you're just trying to utilize that Jack Raid and Ultimate Digimon Fusion to try to basically just uh, loop your Lilith Mons and play a couple of your Omnimon Zorts. Then the Omnimon Zorts are going to fill up your field with level 5s to then utilize more Lilith Mons to then utilize those options again to just build a very big board state very quickly out of nowhere for basically next to no resources. But the only thing that's keeping the deck back is, again, just its consistency. Even though Purple does have a lot of really good consistency tools. It's the fact that it does need time to set up and it does need time to dig and find a lot of its pieces is what's holding it back compared to a lot of these other decks. Because if you're just able to aggro the deck out, then by the time they do get the combo, what's the whole point when you're already dead? So uh, the worst part of the deck is just how slow it is, but when it does go off, it's definitely a really fun deck. Next in the tier 3 slot, we have Dioboromon. So Dioboromon did get a lot of upgrades in the set because half of Black's upgrades were dedicated towards Dioboromon, and the new Dioboromon deck is looking to be pretty good considering it has more and varied ways to spawn Dioboromon tokens, uh, and Dioboromon definitely got a whole lot of new and meaningful tools to just help it push the overall aggression and resource uh, package of what it's trying to do. So you have Armageddon which you could utilize to sacrifice one of your Diabormons to just play a level 7 for 3 that also shuts out the opponent's level 7s uh, when Digivolved abilities, which could definitely harm a lot of decks if that's their game plan, because it could turn a lot of those abilities off, and most of the time those are the removal type abilities, or the ones that they're going to be utilizing to push the overall aggression. So he is kind of a counter deck to uh, decks that are dedicated around level 7s, but uh, he also has the problem where he's just not as consistent as some of the other colors. Yes, you do get a couple of new and interesting tools to help push the overall aggression, like giving all of your Diabormon tokens rush, and uh, you do get a pretty decent resource engine, but it's not necessarily the best in the world compared to a lot of the other colors, and uh, even though it's still just a very powerful deck, it's still lacking a lot of ways to interact with the opponent's Digimon in a meaningful way, thus keeping it back just because uh, you could do some really powerful things, but the opponent can also do some really powerful things counter and respond to you with, and you don't necessarily have the best ways to counter and respond to them with. And then the last deck in the tiers 3 slot is going to be another green Digiburst deck. So this could either go back and forth between uh, green Hercules Kabuterimon from the starter deck or One Punch style. Both of those kind of fit in the same type of slot just because they got a couple of new Digiburst tools to be playing around with. And they're still just both at some very powerful decks. Right now I just have uh, green OTK just put up on here just because that's still a very powerful strategy. Hitting the opponent's security all at once. So so that way you could try to push for lethal the following turn is just straight up good still given the context of the raising meta thus making it this deck really good on top of which with green hercules kabuterimon it's just again another really solid controlled type deck where you punish the opponent for bringing their digimon out of raising first you still have access to nidhogmon and some other very powerful tools to just try to control and manipulate what the opponent can do or what the opponent wants to be doing based on what you could be threatening them with all right, so going over tier four, we have uh, Ancient Greymon. So Ancient Greymon is acting very similar to Ancient Gurumon. It's just Ancient Greymon is doing, you know, red things where Ancient Gurumon is doing classic blue things. So the whole point of Ancient Greymon is to punch the opponent's security as hard as you possibly can. You do have a warp that makes that a little bit easier, and you do have a lot more Greymon synergy and support to add to the overall consistency and power of the deck. But the deck is just lacking still in a lot of the tools that let's just say blue has in order to make your plays more consistent more powerful and more meaningful to try to close out games that much more efficiently with thus uh, why it's in the tier four slots just because it's still a good deck it's just not as good as any of the tier three decks and the same can kind of be said for Green Sarismon, where Green Sarismon did get a couple of new tools, and uh, there are a couple of new Digisorption support. It's just the context of the raising meta isn't necessarily the best thing for what makes Sarismon so good, because Sarismon wants you to have Digimon on your field, and the context of the raising meta says that there's so much removal in the game that you're almost never going to have a field of Digimon, so it makes it very hard uh, for Sarismon to work, just because the opponent isn't going to be having a whole lot of of Digimon on their field, so it really does limit what Sarismon can do, 
but Seraspawn is still just a very powerful Digimon to tempo up into to go into your level 7s, which uh, Green still has uh, two Chaos Mons that it could be playing around with, and on top of which you also have a new Argamon you could consider for the deck. So uh, the new Argamon does hose on Tamers and Tamer-based strategies a little bit by locking them down, so it's not like it's the worst thing in the world, it's just, again, not doing as powerful things, and the context of the meta is definitely keeping the deck back. Next in tier 4, we have Black Blockers. So Black Blockers is just, you know, your classic black deck. It really hasn't changed a whole lot, and it didn't get that many new tools to really push the deck strategy forward, but it's still a very decent deck to consider it, just because of uh, Craniumon being an absolutely insane card, just because we are seeing more and more removal type abilities in the game, and the fact that Craniumon not only gives himself protection because he has blocker, but he gives all of your other blockers protection too just makes the card really really good the only unfortunate thing is right now yellow is just a, one of the strongest colors uh, in the game and yellow's removal does just hose on Craniumon, so just the uh, strong presence of yellow is what's keeping Craniumon back is just because his protection isn't as efficient as it could be to just shut out yellow from being able to delete your Digimon, and uh, that's kind of just why uh, Black Blockers is as low as it is, just because there is a lot of possible yellow decks that all can just hose on Black's overall protection. Next, uh, we have Megazoo. So there's just a couple of different ways that Megazoo could be played, but the whole context on what Megazoo wants to be doing is just playing your fives and your sixes uh, to just uh, go into your level sevens as quickly as you possibly can and try to win off of the back of your level sevens. And your level sevens uh, have a lot of aggro potential and removal potential inside of them. So that's kind of just what makes the deck so powerful is you're just skipping all of the busy work on trying to get all the way up into your high levels. And you could just hard play your high levels. The only unfortunate thing is just giving the opponent a lot of memory is kind of just bad because if they're able to utilize that memory then they'll be able to respond uh, with whatever you're doing and you're just going to end up fueling their game plan. So you could push them to be even more aggressive than they normally would, but if they're unable to respond to your Megas, then that's kind of the whole point and power of the deck, is just Megas that are so powerful that they'll just win you the game off of what they're doing alone. Next, we have Dan Devimon. So Dan Devimon didn't really get a whole lot of new and powerful tools, it's just the fact that it's still a very strong rogue deck to be considering playing. Just because uh, Dan Devimon has uh, the uh, really nice ability to just delete the opponent's security for them trying to go into yours. You have a nice revive ability off of the promo Demi Devimon to just be able to revive your Dan Devimon, always having a board presence and uh, limiting what your opponent can do. On top of which, he just can help discard the opponent's hand as long as he gets deleted. So he's still just a very powerful card in his own right. It's just, uh, again, the context of where the meta is and what everything is doing. He's just not necessarily the greatest deck in the world, but he's still just a very powerful deck and built correctly can still perform relatively well. Next, we have D-Brigade. So D-Brigade, for the most part, is just a Black's Rookie Rush, and you're just trying to play your D-Brigade-type Digimon and try to fill up your trash to just play Dark Dramon and then win off of just Rookie Rushing them down. And you also have Dark Dramon that also has Rush to try to help close out games. It's just it does require a more particular build. You do get a new Commandramon to add to the overall Commandramons that you could be utilizing, but at the end of the day, it is just a worse version of uh, what Rookie Rush could be, and uh, that's the only reason why it's being held back is just because it is just Rookie Rush, but slightly different. And unfortunately, Black doesn't have the best resource engine, let alone uh, on the low end. Now, you could supplement it with a purple engine, but again, you're just playing a worse version of uh, Rookie Rush, and that's basically the whole point on why it's so low on this list, but because it is still a Rookie Rush style of deck, it's still pretty decent and can still move relatively efficiently. It just is a little bit more clunkier than your classic Rookie Rush. And then the last deck on uh, this list that I'm going to be talking about is going to be a uh, Plutomon uh, Tactimon deck, just because uh, both of those have some really good synergy. 
So Plutomon got a new option thanks to Tactimon in the form of Earthshaker, so Plutomon has even more options in terms of removal and control tools. And then on top of which, if you don't feel like it utilizing Plutomon, then you also have Tactimon, which is basically the equivalent of a one-man army just because he wants to be alone. And Plutomon, for the most part, can act alone also just because Plutomon plays your options for free. And then Tactimon just wants to be alone, and you could utilize some really powerful tools to make sure that he stays alone to just try to make Tactimon as powerful as you possibly can. So it's just another very decent control style deck for purple. It's just, again, it's not doing as powerful of things as some of the other purple decks, thus keeping it back, but it's still a deck to consider, and it's still a very decent and powerful deck. And then just as a closing disclaimer, the meta is going to always keep changing and evolving over time because part of what makes up a meta is what's being played and how much of it is being represented. So uh, this is just a subject to change based on what the meta is going to actually be doing. So this is just my interpretation of how I think the meta is going to be playing out, where you're probably going to be seeing a lot of the tier 1 and tier 2 decks, and then not so much the tier 3, tier 4, and then anything else. But as I mentioned before, a lot of the cards that, that I didn't bother including will just end up being in some of these top tier decks as uh, possible tech options uh, to consider. So if I don't mention something, don't feel super bad about uh, it not being in here because it could easily end up as a card in one of the top tier decks. Anything else that's not on this list, it doesn't mean that it's a particularly a bad deck. It's just not going to perform as well as some of the decks that are going to be on this list. Just because uh, Digimon is a pretty interesting card game where I feel like almost any deck could win if built and played correctly. And if the opponent also gets really unlucky and they don't see their pieces and their deck just decides not to work, then they could also lose that game relatively easily no matter what deck, even the top tier ones. So uh, keep that in mind when building and deciding what you want to be playing in this meta, and uh, I hope everyone has a really fun time with BT05 because it's definitely looking like it's going to be a really fun and interesting meta with just a whole bunch of decks that you could be playing. So that's all I really have for this video. As always, feel free to tell me your thoughts down in the comments below, and down in the description below are different ways that you could support me in the channel. So one of those ways is I do have a TCG player affiliate link so whenever you use that affiliate link to buy cards off of tcgplayer.com then some of the money will go to supporting me in the channel and on top of which i also do stream over on twitch.tv slash zenitsu so following and subbing is a good way to support me over on that platform as well and on top of that i also do make and sell playmats over on overcard gamers uh, on facebook so whenever you buy one of my designs through them, then some of that money will also help go to supporting me in the channel. And as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more content, and I'll see you in the next video.